You know, war is the health of the state, and there's no question that uh, we've made it easy to finance these wars. We also have a new new technologies that are coming on board all the time in military use, and as a result, uh, we want to test out these uh, new instruments of war. All right, Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Artie, it's a pleasure to be on your show. And I uh, look forward to uh, your provocative questions. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so a little bit about you. So you are an economist, financial advisor, and an author of over 25 books on economics and finance. Uh, you hold a PhD in economics from George Washington University. Uh, you taught at Columbia University, and you're currently the presidential fellow at Chapman University editor of the investment newsletter Forecasts and Strategies, prominent advocate of Austrian economics and libertarian principles. And then something we'll dive into a bit today, you are the founding producer of Freedom Fest, the world's largest gathering of free minds. Uh, that's in Las Vegas this year. Uh, the, the, the festival is titled A Brave New World. Is that right? That's our theme. Uh, okay. Are we entering a brave new world based on Otis Huxley's novel that in the early 1930s, which has been quite prescient. Yeah, definitely. It's a great book too. Um, so that'll feature Ice T, uh, Rob Schneider, Steve Forbes, Stephen Pinker, Robert Kiyosaki, and uh, MC Kennedy as speakers in the event. I'm really excited for that. Anything you want to add on to about you? So one of the things that I've, I've always believed in one foot in the academic world and one foot in the real world. And in fact, I, my basic view is that um, if you want to teach economics or engineering or politics or what have you, real world, you, there's no excuse for not having real world experience. I think a pure academic approach of high theory leaves a lot to be uh, desired. Uh, so I've always, uh, after I got my PhD in economics, uh, I've been involved in uh, actually uh, running businesses, uh, buy, uh, buying and selling, uh, hiring and firing. Uh, I myself have been hired and fired maybe two or three times in my life. And this real world experience is really valuable. So I wrote my textbooks. I've written a couple of textbooks, but particularly my textbook, Economic Logic, is based entirely on my experience. And it, it's a very different book because of my real world experience. So for example, uh, if you ever take an economics course, you start with supply and demand curves. Well, I don't do that. I start with the P&L statement, the profit and loss income statement, the financial statement. Uh, and the reason I do that is because it can tell you so much more about the dynamics of the economy, because with supply and demand, you're, you're at that point of equilibrium. All right. Well, if you're at equilibrium, then what's the point of creating a new product or changing the production process? You're at equilibrium, so there's no need for change. But as you know, the economy is fully uh, dynamic uh, of profit and loss. There's constant change. There is no such thing as equilibrium. And so profit and loss uh, is a great way to demonstrate that. So I have some graphics in economic logic. I do get to supply and demand. Don't get me wrong. Supply and demand has value. But um, I think students really appreciate my real world example because profit and loss is real. Supply and demand curves may exist. They may not exist. It's hard to pinpoint them. Yeah. So I've always been an adjunct professor uh, until this last year at Chapman University. I was appointed the first Doty Spogli Chair of Free Enterprise. So adjunct does good. And I now have a full chair at Chapman University. And I teach, uh, teach a variety of courses at Chapman University um, and uh, really enjoy uh, 
connecting with students in our rising generation because a lot of people have lost faith in students uh, in our future generation. But this has kind of restored my faith in America to see the young people determined to get ahead. They don't just look, they also read. I tell my students, I say more and more students just look and they don't read. So I was glad to see my students are doing quite a bit of reading and and becoming more knowledgeable in in depth studies, which you can't really do when you just look at your cell phone. You mentioned uh, your real world experience, but that's not always the case with a lot of professors uh, around the country. A lot of professors are teaching something that they haven't either have never actually had real world experience in or haven't in, you know, possibly decades. How big of a problem is that in academia? Well, I think it's less and less of a problem. Uh, Mike's uh, looking at uh, Ivy League schools, for example, uh, there are lots of uh, professors who are also consultants. Uh, in And so they, they consult in the courtroom and the corporate ballroom or uh, boardrooms. Uh, uh, they consult with government and stuff like that. So there's there's definitely a move toward more hands-on uh, activity. But I do think that the textbooks uh, have, have much to be desired. Um, I'll give you just an example. Paul Samuelson, uh, who wrote uh, the economics textbook that was the most popular textbook, one that I used when I was taking college in the 1960s. Samuelson was a Keynesian economist, pure academic, did hardly any real world studies. Uh, All of his, almost all of his papers uh, for which he won the Nobel prize were high theory. And he just never got his hands dirty very often in any kind of data and studies and so forth. So, and, and he also didn't really spend a lot of time traveling. I mean, I've been to 88 countries. It makes a huge difference. Uh, you think Japan, for example, you keep reading about how Japan, uh, the stock market has been in a funk for, for decades. And uh, you think that Japan is in permanent recession. But then when you go to Japan and you see how vibrant the people are and how they have every product and service imaginable in their tiny apartments and they tra- and they travel everywhere and they they just are very energetic people so it's a total different view that what you get from the textbooks or even looking at government statistics so uh i think that's important and paul samuelson is famous for having written in 1987 right before the collapse of the berlin wall and the soviet model he said that uh that these uh, the Soviet economy is proof that uh, a socialist economy can work and even thrive was the terms he used. And see, the problem is he he had not spent any time that I can tell in the Soviet Union to make that statement, which was totally incorrect if he had spent any time there. Now, I took my wife and two children to the Soviet Union in 1988 before the collapse of the Soviet system. And I said, instead of taking us to the museums, can you take us to a local grocery store? So the guide took us to a local grocery store and it was just a great eye opener to see they only had one kind of bread. Uh, It was nice, hot black bread, but only one kind of bread. There was a long line for people wanting to get, uh, they, they had heard a rumor that chickens were coming. Uh, so they lined up uh, 12 deep waiting for chickens to arrive. They had this huge, uh, long uh, row of toilet bowl cleaner. And we asked the guide, I said, so how come you have all this toilet bowl cleaner here? He said, oh, well, they made too much of that. So you often think of the Soviet economy as a shortage economy, but it was also a surplus economy. They mm. they didn't uh, make enough of what people wanted, and they made too much of stuff that people don't want. So it was a really screwed up economy. Half the lights were out uh, in the grocery store. And of course, today you go to the Soviet Union, you can't see that because the grocery stores are all 
packed full of goods made in the East as well as the West. And capitalism has won that debate. But Paul Samuelson didn't realize that when he wrote in his textbook that everything was really doing well. People were doing quite well in the Soviet Union uh, back in the uh, in the late 80s, when in fact they they were not doing well at all. So that's just an example. Where was his data coming from? Was he just reading papers? Did he actually travel there, did you say? No, he. I don't have any evidence, I don't think, based on his statement that he actually spent any time there. Um, but I will tell you, their data, his data was based on the CIA data, and I worked for the CIA for two or three years. And we simply just took uh, the raw data. Okay, so how many tons of uh, uh, of steel did uh, the Soviet Union produce? And then we put a Western price on that, and that became a GDP statistic. So uh, the statistics look good that the Soviet Union was growing uh, and was doing really well based on the CIA statistics, and that's what Samuelson relied on. And it's turned out to be bogus uh, because uh, you produce the steel, but it, were this, was the steel put to good use or was it used to building uh, uh, silos or building uh, apartment buildings that, uh, that were in, sh- in short supply? There are lots of problems with using a, a raw data like that and without actually seeing if it's misappropriated Mis, uh, misinvested, if you will, in the wrong kind of goods and services. My understanding is you you don't like or you have a critique of GDP as a a measure of economic health in general for any country, right? So gross, uh, it's not so much that I'm a critic of GDP. It's just that uh, it's important to know the limitations of GDP. What a lot of people don't realize, they, it's kind of skimmed over in the textbooks, but GDP is actually a measure of finished or final goods and services only. So it doesn't include any of the stages of production to produce the, the finished goods. So my hat, my tie, uh, your shirt, your artwork in the back, all of that's included in GDP because those are finished products. However, any kind of raw commodities going through various stages of production that business spends tons of money on capital investment to move the production process along from the earliest stage to the final stage that's not included in GDP. The supply chain is left out of GDP Mm. is what we're saying. And how important is the supply chain? Well, without the supply chain, you don't have any GDP. So my argument is we need to measure that. And fortunately, and I've been advocating that. I wrote a book called The Structure of Production in 1990. It's a purely academic book, but it caught my imagination to realize what's missing from GDP. And when you realize that over half the economy is missing from GDP, because it's not just retail, you have to look at wholesale you have to look at the production process. You have to have a look at raw commodities. And what's really interesting is that 80% of all employees are in the supply chain. Uh, I mean, only 20% of uh, workers actually work in retail, the retail stores that you see and uh, when you're buying an automobile or you're buying groceries or you're going to an entertainment and so on. That's retail. Or... Um, going on vacation, if you take a cruise, that's retail. Only 20% of all workers work in retail. 80% work in the supply stages of production, wholesale, retail, uh, or wholesale and um, earlier stage, a resource stage, manufacturing. That's where most people work. And so what I wanted to do was come up with a statistic to measure spending at all stages of production. And that's known as, and I labeled it gross output. Well, in April of 2014, the federal government, the Bureau of Economic Analysis that puts out GDP, decided to start measuring gross output, or all the, including the supply chain. 
So now we have a top line and a bottom line in national income accounting with my gross output statistics. So this is a great breakthrough. This is a paradigm shift in economics. Because what you find out is that uh, business spending is the biggest, by, by far the bigger sector in the economy when you look just at, at uh, all the stages of production, if you measure it from gross output statistics. And retail or consumer spending is only a third, not two thirds of the economy. So that's a big breakthrough. And it's only gradually being adopted by economists. It's only in a few textbooks. Uh, more and more investors. Are using it. I, did, I did, did get an article in the New York Times last uh, last year uh, on uh, on G.O. And also I've made several articles in The Wall Street Journal on on uh, gross output. And gross output, the supply chain, by the way, is growing at a very slow pace, uh, suggesting we're in a stagflation economy right now, rather than a robust, booming economy that Biden would like to see. The stock market's doing great, but uh, the economy, the underlying economy is in a slow growth mode. The, the whole stock market doing well thing is kind of funny because... The party that's not in power, if if the economy or if the stock market is doing well, the the party that's not in power will say that doesn't mean anything. But when it's their term and it's doing well, it's everything, right? Yeah, the stock market is actually a pretty good leading indicator. It's one of the uh, 10 leading indicators by the conference board of where the economy is going. And it's one of the few indicators that's positive right now. And so... Um, uh, Jay Powell and the Fed have inter- en- engineered a pretty good, uh, stable environment. They've raised raised interest rates, uh, and that's created some alarm and a bit of a bear market in uh, t- 2022. But since then, uh, they've they've done a pretty good job of uh, of engineering a bull market, if you will. And there is some interesting studies that show that if the stock market does well in an election year, it's favorable toward the incumbents. Hmm. So the Biden administration should be pleased with the stock market doing as well as it's doing. However, I should point out that inflation is elevated, as everybody knows. And uh, uh, in real terms, the stock market is nowhere. uh, It's it's uh, really kind of popped out in 2021 in real terms. So um, it's a mixed bag, I think, in terms of the uh, whether Biden administration can benefit from a rising stock market uh, in November. Uh, I think most of the studies, uh, most of the betting odds, as well as the polls show that Trump is likely to win over Biden simply because Biden has just been, uh, I think people realize he's he's too old to be president, uh, to be able to be the leader of the Western world. And uh, for a man who, boy, can you imagine waking up at three in the morning, there's a threat of a nuclear war and and Biden has to get awake and (laughs) And know what he's doing. I don't know. It's it's kind of problematic for actually having both of these these guys. Yeah. I think are both too old, old. We need a new generation of leaders, and we're not getting that. Do you have any thoughts on why we're not getting that? Um, we do have our two party system, which is really entrenched and. Um, I I don't know. That's a good question. Um, it's kind of a fluke in some ways, though, because uh, you have so many diehard pro-Trump type people who won't listen to reason or anything. I've had I've had numerous debates with uh, Trumpsters, and uh, I've I've called out a lot of the problems that that you get with Trump and his personality and and stuff. But it's just like going through one ear and out the other. And then in terms of Biden, it's not so much being pro-Biden as being anti-Trump. Trump has been so divisive in this country that uh, 
it's really unfortunate that we're faced with these these two candidates. I do think that Biden should have uh, dropped out uh, knowing he's not really capable uh, mentally. He has to be injected with something to keep up on things yeah. in the debate this Thursday. We'll we'll see about that. I think it's it's really hard to give up power. And Biden doesn't want to give up the power. I mean, what's he going to do in retirement? He'll probably die rather quickly uh, when there's nothing to do each day. And certainly his wife, Dr. Jill, loves the power and is probably much more influential than we realize because she is still uh, uh, pretty sharp. So uh, it's... uh, it's a bit of a conundrum. It's it's hard to explain, except that we have entrenched this two party system. And one of them, you're if you're the president, you really call the shots. Uh, LBJ, he was wise enough to say, hey, it's not working for me. I'm going to retire and drop out of the race. And so uh, Humphrey took took his place. So that was a uh, a smart decision, his unpopularity of the Vietnam War and stuff going back in history. Yeah. Um, and as far as uh, Trump is concerned, he's an egomaniac. And so he's not going to nat- naturally drop out and let somebody. We have so many competent, really good, sharp governors and uh, congressmen and senators who could step in as president. But uh we're we're really stuck with these two candidates i'm afraid it's it's kind of surprising it's it's not too surprising on the republican side to have trump because of his how big his personality is to me it is surprising to me that biden was the end result for the democrats because for it seemed to me like on their end that it was basically fair game for everyone to compete for that position and to end up being the nominee. And it seems like the, the party establishment basically picked Biden before anything, before uh, the primaries were even started and Biden was their guy from the get go. Would you agree with that? Well, I don't know. It's just uh, really hard to figure out. Um, Obviously, Governor Newsom is this young, vibrant, good looking, uh, articulate candidate who can sound like a Republican conservative uh, when he's being interviewed by Hannity. Um, But he's done such a poor job having spent considerable amount of time in California. I can tell that his attitude is. We can do anything in California and people will still come. We can raise taxes. We can regulate. We can drive out business. And who cares? Because wealthy people are going to come to beautiful California no matter what. I I really think that's his attitude. Hmm. But he can't run the country that way. He's going to lose even though he's popular and a good uh, speaker and so forth. So so you have a vacuum. And Biden is filling that vacuum. Uh, Actually, Wall Street loves Sleepy Joe because Joe is not doing anything. I I mean, he's obviously doing some stuff, but it doesn't seem to have affected the the markets in general because you do have gridlock with the Republicans in uh, on Capitol Hill. And the market does seem to like gridlock um, and it keeps the really bad legislation from becoming law. The problem is, of course, Biden's executive powers and what his administration is doing in the EPA and all of this hysteria over global warming and how you we have to go toward EVs, electronic vehicles completely, even though hybrids are very obvious. Hybrids are a much better vehicle, much more dependable, very little pollution. It has all it's much more reliable. And but these ideologues that are running 
the government, the Biden administration, uh, they're totally ignoring uh, this and saying, oh, we got to go 100 percent EVs mm. by uh, and, and even trucks and stuff like that. And to show you how bad it's gotten, uh, have you been following this uh, story in the uh, Paris Olympics where they've decided not to have air conditioning in in the summer in Paris. Listen, I've been no, to Paris know. in the summer. It's hot. It's humid. And if you get a shower or two, that's a good thing. But these, these, so the U S and Australia and other Olympic, they're bringing in these portable air conditioners, which are even more, uh, use of energy and, uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> I just, uh, it gets back to what I, we were talking about at the beginning of my, of this interview where I say you need to, you need to be practical, real world. You need to be real world in your, and, and not set these ideological rules, hard and fast rules that you're not going to have air conditioning and, and moving back to uh, primitive times, because that way we we don't heat we don't heat the uh, the the atmosphere and stuff. It's just uh, insane. Yeah the the aspect of being ideologues is interesting because quite often there's critiques of religious people for for having blind spots in. They just believe something and then they run with it without kind of taking a look at everything. But I don't see a big difference between ideology and religion other than who's at the head of them. You know, a religion puts God at the head. Ideology puts typically the state or some kind of political philosophy at the head of the ideology. So the two are kind of hand in hand to me with a little bit, dif- a little bit of differences, of course, too. Well, certainly, uh, the global warming movement has become a religion, if that's what yeah. you mean. Uh, yeah. And and where it, there is a attitude in religion as well of of uh, God speaks and whatever He says, we do, and whoever His prophet is, whatever He says, we we have to do. And then you you worry about the Jim Joneses of the world where take the drink the purple Kool-Aid and you die. Uh, that's an extreme example. Um, I prefer the view of, uh, of uh, Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, who said, we teach them correct principles and they govern themselves. Not that the Mormon faith lives up to that, uh, refrain, but it is a good one. It's very libertarian, actually. Uh, you teach people how to behave, uh, and they you govern yourselves. So, I mean, as a libertarian, I'm in favor of legalization of drugs, alcohol, so forth, within the certain rules and regulations. Uh, but uh, 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 that doesn't mean I'm you, just because it's legal doesn't mean that that therefore you should drink and take drugs and so forth. Uh, you have your choice. Mm-hmm. I like the, um, I have a, bo- a group of contradictory books in my bookshelves in my home. And so it's a whole group of books like Asia Rising, Asia Falling, How to Win Friends and Influence People, How to Lose Friends and Alienate People, uh, Small is Good, Small is Bad, Go West, young man. Go East, young man. So I, I got all these contradictory titles, and it's really kind of a fun group of books. So one of my contradictory two books right next to each other kind of says it all about philosophy and, and behavior. The first one's called Free to Choose by Milton Friedman. And Friedman's basically saying, hey, you have to have the free to choose what school you want to go to, uh, what business you want to go into, what price you want to charge, how much wages you want to uh, earn, 
what business you want to go into, free to choose, as maximum maximum freedom to choose. And his basic thesis is a positive one. If you choose, if you have your choice, you're probably going to choose the right thing. You're going to do the right thing. Right next to it is a book by a Marxist named John Romer, who teaches at Yale University. And his book is called Free to Lose. Hmm. Free to Lose. So what is he saying? Well, he's saying if you give people ma- that maximum freedom that Milton Friedman's talking about, you're going to lose. You're going to, if you have free enterprise, you're going to be fired. Uh, you're going to go bankrupt. You're going to squeeze the wage earner uh, and take excessive profits. Uh, if drugs are legal, you're going to overdose. If alcohol is legal, you're going to be a, uh, you're going to become a, a, dr- a regular a drunk. Um, so you can see both sides of this issue, how freedom is a very controversial term. And mm-hmm. so you can, you can see why some people say, well, we got to mandate everything. Because uh, if we don't mandate it, we're going to have these evil consequences of drug overdoses, and drunkenness and uh, and so and uh, bad business and bankruptcies and collapse in the economy and stuff like that. So we got to regulate everything. But unfortunately, in today's world, everything is being either. More and more, everything is either being mandated or prohibited, so. We're being squeezed from both sides, like in the Star Wars, uh, that one place where the the doors or the room is closing on each side, squeezing and squeezing and squeezing. And one's called prohibition and the other's called mandates. And we're being squeezed from both sides. And I think it's an unfortunate move in uh, a direction toward tyranny. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think the... We're in a very weird position as a society. We like in the U.S. We're the land of the free, right? That's what we're known to be. But it doesn't feel free. It doesn't. I mean, me starting a business, I don't feel very free. I feel like the government is breathing down my neck at every turn. You know, waiting for some cut of everything and and some regulation that I have to ad- abide by and stuff like that. So it doesn't quite feel free, but then the concept of freedom is kind of an elusive concept in general. Yeah. um, So are you familiar with the economic freedom index that the Fraser Institute puts out as well as the Heritage Foundation? Have you ever heard of it? The economic freedom index? Yeah. So they've done lots of studies comparing one country to another, and they actually have an index of five or six criteria on trade and business regulation and taxes and government spending and all of this stuff to determine how economically free a country is. And Singapore is in the number one country. It used to be Hong Kong for many years until the Chinese uh, cr- cl- cracked down on uh, Hong Kong. So Singapore is up there, but the United States has been up there for quite some time, but it's been in decline. The economic freedom index in the United States since nine. 9- 9-11 and the Patriot Act have seen a decline. So instead of, we used to be the, in the top three countries of economic freedom, and now we're number 12 or number 20. I mean, it depends on the index that you use. There's definitely been a decline. However, you look at, there was an interesting study recently. One of the speakers at, at Freedom Fest, Matt Ridley, He's a, a Lord, Lord Matt Ridley. Uh, he's a public intellectual and scientist uh, from uh, the UK. He's written a book called in- How Innovation Works, and he compares innovation from country to country. And what's interesting is he said that Europe, uh, if you look at the European uh, top valued companies in Europe, in France, in the UK, in Germany, there, there have been very few new companies created. Uh, over the last 30 or 40 years. They're all still the same old companies. Um, Meanwhile, in the United States, you have uh, new companies. You have Amazon, you have Google, you have Facebook, uh, you have Apple. You have all of these different 
the companies that have now dominate the world. In fact, I ask my students, I say, name me the five biggest companies, most influential, biggest companies in the world. And of course, they, they're all U.S. based. They're Amazon and Microsoft and uh, mm-hmm. Google and uh, Facebook and all uh, Costco and Boeing. And the list goes on and on. Uh, very little competition. And so we do have we do have these dynamics that we've always had for American exceptionalism. But like you say, uh, more and more, maybe maybe that's maybe near the end of that. Uh, AI is hopefully going to reignite. I mean, it's made NVIDIA one of the biggest companies in the world now uh, yeah. with their uh, chips and their AI discoveries and so forth. Very controversial. But where is the dynamics coming from? Well, NVIDIA is a U.S. company run by a Chinese. OK. So, but we invite uh, foreigners as entrepreneurs to come to this country, whether it's Microsoft and and NVIDIA and, and other companies that are uh, Google and stuff that, that are run by uh, foreigners. Uh, Elon Musk is an example. Tesla coming from South Africa. So that's that's a positive that we can say still exists. So despite your pessimism, maybe there's still something for this uh, suggestion that that we can develop in a new dynamic models to innovate and improve our standard of living. I'm ho- I'm still hopeful. I'm hopeful too. I, I think that I think there there's always ebb and flow with things. And I think we're in a period of possibly less freedom right now, but I think we'll, we'll see more freedom uh, at the end of the tunnel or maybe not the end of the tunnel, but in the future, I think things could get better, but you know, what, get a little uh, work uh, first. Uh, Artie, you should, uh, have you ever read this new book by Walter Isaacson on Elon Musk? It's a big, thick book is a mm. biography of Elon Musk. And what's really uh, telling about that book is how often Elon Musk says, well, what do you mean we have to follow this regulation? Who, who made up this regulation? Uh, was it a government agent? Uh, was it a uh, corporate decision? And who, in, who made up this? And, and let's call him on the phone. And, and his attitude is, um, well, let, let's just forget the regulation. Let's ignore the regulation and see what happens. I mean, it's mm-hmm. truly quite shocking. Uh, so, I mean, Elon Musk is very much a libertarian, I think, in, at heart. I think that'd be a better attitude for more people to have when it comes to regulation. Not that some regulation isn't a good thing, but I think as a society, we get used to the fact that certain rules and regulations are in place. And instead of saying, why, why is this here? And does it actually serve its purpose? We just go along with it because we're used to it at at a certain point. But I think it's better to constantly be questioning things and say, what is the purpose of this? And is it actually achieving that purpose? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, that's not the mentality of most uh, corporate uh, structures. Um, There's this emphasis on... uh, making sure we comply, comply, maximum, not minimum compliance, but maximum compliance. In fact, I was inter- I interviewed Charles Koch one time, uh, just a couple of years ago. He had a book come out and stuff. And, and he had won a number of awards from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is kind of surprising because Koch had an attitude of minimal compliance for many years. And I said, so I see you're now winning awards instead of getting uh, fined by the EPA for this or that violation, uh, Coke Industries, you're now getting uh, awards. And he smiles and says, well, yeah, we changed our policy from minimum compliance to maximum compliance. And so uh, the EPA is our partner. And I said, really? What, what about the IRS? Oh, yes, the IRS is our partner. And so 
uh, they've kind of given up the fight to, uh, I mean, they, maybe they in back door, they, they try to work with minimizing, uh, these kinds of legislation, but I was really kind of taken aback by it. Uh, Elon Musk seems to have adopted this minimal compliance. And as a result, he's suffering from fines and criticism and stuff like that. So there is a difference in approach. But I will say that most people are moving in the direction of, of Coke Industries. In fact, I, I knew an accountant who in his spare time, I said, well, what do you do in your spare time? And he says, well, we track down regulations that we think were out of compliance and we need to comply we need to find out what taxes we're not paying. We need to find out what regulations are not paying. <laughs> I thought, oh, my gosh, what is this country coming to? Yeah, that's really interesting. I Very interesting. Earlier, you mentioned uh, Keynesian economics. And Keynesian, Austrian economics, those are words that outside of economic circles most people don't really understand what those mean. Uh, I didn't for a long time. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on um, what what Keynesian economics is. I know it's the prevailing economic theory in the world right now, and it has been for several decades. But can you dive into that and where does Austrian economics differ? Right. So Keynesian economics is not universal, but it certainly kicks in whenever there's a recession or a financial crisis. What happens, uh, Keynes, who is a British economist in the 1930s, wrote a book called The General Theory. And his view was that we we must reject the classical model of uh, pulling back and retrenching during a uh, contraction in the economy that actually I mean, it makes sense for consumers to contract and it makes sense for business to to minimize expenditures and save as much as you can, cut costs and lay off workers and stuff like that. That makes sense. But the government doesn't need to do that. The government can uh, stimulate the economy because they have the ability to print money. They have the ability to borrow money at very uh, low interest rates uh, because they have a AAA rating. So for those reasons between borrowing and uh, 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 and printing of money, we can do a much better job to to get the economy getting get back on track earlier instead of going through a multi year contraction, a recession, depression in the economy, and suffering people out of work and and all that sort of thing. So this was kind of a permanent revolution in economics that we would run deficits and easy money policies during. Uh, during tough times. So that's the, that's the Keynesian aspect. However, when you reach full employment, when you're back to normal, then the Adam Smith model or the Austrian model or the classical model kind of kicks in, which is let's depend on private enterprise to hire workers and to create new technological advances and we encourage entrepreneurship and we encourage saving and investing and uh, banking and uh, new technologies and all of the good things. That's all Austrian, classical, supply side. Uh, and, and that's when it, it, when it needs to perform the best. The biggest problem with the Keynesian model is that even in the good times, we get used to deficit spending and we should be running a surplus right now because we're at full employment. That's even the Keynesians argue that, but we're not doing it. Why aren't we doing it? Because we don't have any mechanism. We don't have a constitutional amendment that keeps control of our budget during the good times. Hmm. And we need to adopt some kind of a system to to conform with the Keynesian model during the good times, which is a balanced budget. So you need a balanced budget amendment. And if we can finally get that passed, I was reading Orrin Hatch was a longtime friend and he was in 
in Senate for 42 years. And there was this book that came out that said the two most influential senators got more legislation passed since World War II. Okay. The two senators were Orrin Hatch, number one, and Ted Kennedy, number two. Okay. Hmm. And they were best of friends and they worked together and they got lots of legislation pushed through. But every year, Orrin Hatch would introduce, he got lots of legislation passed, but every year he wanted a balanced budget amendment, but he could never get it done. No. So he was a failure in a lot of ways because uh, he couldn't get what was ultimately going to keep us from headed to a major financial crisis of excessive debt, deficit spending, interest rates, inflation out of control. This is the biggest uh, legacy of Keynesian economics is you've let the, the back door of the barn door open and the cattle have escaped. And uh, you need to be able to close that door and live within your means in the good times. That's when you yeah. set up a rainy day fund. States have rainy day funds for when the bad times come. So during the good times, you you create a surplus harvest. You save money. Uh, and by the way, business has done a really great job of that. If you look at what happened after the 2008 financial crisis with most country, most companies had serious problems, especially financial companies, banks and so on, all failing. Um, look at now, if you look at Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, do you see how much cash they have? No. I mean, they got $100 billion in cash or more. Yeah. They are in good shape. They've cut their costs. They, they haven't, they've rejected the Keynesian model or the, the, they have realized that you have to adopt the Austrian classical supply side model of building up surpluses and be in good financial shape when the bad times, because you're, you got to be prepared for the bad times. And we all know that the most recent crisis will not be the last. There's going to be another one coming down the road. We don't know what it's going to be, but we better be prepared for it. I think businesses, big business has really done a good job in preparing for that. Yeah, business has, but the government has been horrible with it because there's a, you know, we have the airlines. Of course, that was 9-11, but still, the airlines had to be bailed out. And then uh, GM had to be bailed out. The banks had to be bailed out. And it seems like every time you bail out one, it puts you on the hook for a future one. Is that right? Uh, yes, uh, there is that uh, uh, problem of uh, precedence. And um, so I still remember the time that uh, uh, Chrysler, uh, Lee Iacocca, Iacocca wanted to bail, wanted Chrysler to be bailed out. And that was coming before Congress and Senator I. Senator Hatch came up to me and said, you know, I'm, I'm really thinking of supporting Iacocca and bailing out Chrysler. I said, well, Senator Hatch, you go ahead and do that, but don't ever call yourself Mr. Free Enterprise anymore. Hmm. Because Ford is a really good example of where Ford said, well, you know, instead of running to Congress and getting a bailout because of uh, competition from the Japanese, We've decided to take the Japanese on directly and improve, uh, cut our costs, imp improve the quality of our product. And so the Ford uh, cars are built better as a result of that, as opposed to GM or a Chrysler, which has all kinds of problems. Ford is really ranked pretty highly because they decided to compete. Rather than get subsidies, they decided to compete with the Japanese. So there's a lot to be said for that that kind of a model. And thank goodness for free trade, which I know is being criti criticized today by Trump and others. But free trade has made our products better, cheaper, uh, quality-wise. Uh, 
our automobiles. I mean, imagine what cars would be like if we just had the big three automobiles running our country. You'll notice that when you drive around, it's hard to find an American-made car on the roads these days. I, I asked my students at Chapman, I said, so just by a show of hands, how many of you have an American-made car? How many have a Ford, Chrysler, um, Chevy, uh, GM car? And not a single hand went up. I had 35, 40 students. They all had foreign cars yeah. because the uh, European and uh, Japanese have set the standards for quality and design. And U.S., has improved their automobiles as a result. They're still in business. They don't need to be subsidized. Hmm. It, it seems like there's a problem in our country as far as economics and, and to a certain degree, business is concerned as it relates to that with uh, short-term versus long-term thinking. Like all the bailouts, the debt, it's it's all to help in the short-term without regard for the long-term. Is that right? Well, not completely. I mean, you did have TARP uh, in the 2008 financial crisis where Congress uh, subs- and gave loan money basically to lots of banks and to GM and various uh, big manufacturers. And all that money was paid back. Did you know that? All the TARP mm-hmm. money has been paid back. But uh, again, uh, Let's look at uh, BB&T Bank, uh, John Allison's bank, the third largest bank or the largest bank in the South, was just a small regional bank and became the third, the largest bank in the South. It's now called Truist Bank. Uh, he was re- he refused the TARP money. He he told Ben Bernanke and and uh, Geithner, uh, the Treasury Secretary, uh, we we don't need it. We actually made money this year in 2008 because he refused any of the uh, refused to do any of the sub sub uh, uh, no doc and and uh, subprime mortgages. He just refused to do it. He wouldn't loan money to people who didn't qualify. Yeah. Prudent man rule. And uh, so as a result of that. He said to Ben Bernanke and Tim Geithner, oh, well, we, we don't need the TARP money. Well, you're going to take it anyway. Well, what do you mean? Well, because if you refuse it, that means we have this list of banks and now some people will sell, that will sell off all their other banks and they'll put money with the Truist Bank, with BB&T Bank. We have to make sure everybody gets the TARP money like they all need it. So he was forced to take the TARP money and he paid it off as soon as he could immediately. But I thought that was a great story on how, again, companies and financial institutions, they don't all have, they don't all have to follow the uh, hook, line and sinker with the government bailouts. Yeah. And then when, when you see like a, uh maybe Biden on the uh, his annual speech in his uh, State of the Union address, you hear the word deficit used a lot. We reduce the deficit. We reduce the deficit. And it seems like a lot of people maybe conflate that with reduce the debt. But the national debt has never decreased in my lifetime and before that. I don't think there's ever been a year where the national debt has gone down. But a deficit is just Okay, we're overspending by a hundred billion dollars. Now we're overspending by just ninety-one billion dollars. So it's still a we're still in the red every single year, but they they tout that accomplishment of reducing it by a few billion as reducing the debt. Is that just strategic kind of wordplay? Yes, yeah, so it meant to be popular that we're trying to be somewhat responsible, fiscally responsible when in fact they're still borrowing money and it is a problem. Uh, I do remember just to show you that we can turn things around. So in the late 1990s, Bill Clinton worked with Newt Gingrich to uh, actually control government spending. And they actually had a surplus there very briefly uh, in 1999, year 2000, before 9-11 occurred. 
And I was meeting with, uh, I was in Palm, De- uh, Palm uh, uh, Beach, uh, Florida, with some wealthy clients. And uh, Newt Gingrich was one of their guests. So we were having breakfast together. And he was just giddy with excitement. And, I, and he said, uh, you can't believe the surpluses that we're seeing uh, as a result of my agreement with Bill Clinton to control spending. We're balancing the budget. In fact, we're saving so much money that within 10 years, we can pay off the whole national debt. So what should we do with this money? We can we can give it back to the people in tax cuts or Maybe we start spending it uh, prudently on really good programs of infrastructure and that sort of thing. What do you think we should do? And of course, I really didn't know what to say other than just to suggest that I I thought it would be better to cut taxes and l- l- give it back to the people. But it was so funny how giddy he was with excitement about what this meant for the United States. And, and I would tend to agree with you. Uh, but of course, that all blew up in smoke after 9-11 with the Patriot Act and we had a recession. And then we had the uh, uh, financial crisis of 2008. And so uh, we haven't had any anywhere near, as you say, anywhere near a balanced budget since then. And again, it's because this is the legacy of Keynesian economics, and we haven't we haven't really dealt with it like we should. And I should also be critical of the supply siders because the supply siders have had a don't care attitude also about the deficit because they say, well, if we just cut taxes, we'll grow out of the economy. Well, it it just gives more money. More money goes to Washington, and they Congress says, hey, we're getting more money, in, and I guess that means we can spend more. So unless you actually have a balanced budget amendment, you're not going to be able to control uh, what goes on in Washington. And let me mention one other thing, which is really important. There's a wonderful chart that was done by a couple of Harvard economists who showed that inflation, price inflation, was not a problem until World War II. The only time inflation flared up in our long history was due to wars. When we'd have the American Revolution, the War of 1812, the Civil War, World War I, whenever we had these wars, we had a, we had a flare up of inflation. But then after the war, inflation would come back down because we were on a gold standard. But after World War II, that all changed. We entered an era of permanent inflation. So you see this chart where you see inflation flaring up and then coming back down. And then after World War II, it just keeps the price level just keeps going up and up. It's quite an anomaly. You can Google it. It's CPI inflation since 1776. And you look at this chart and it kind of stable and then it just keeps rising after World War II. So I asked my students, well, what is the cause of this? How did we have this change of going from temporary inflation to permanent inflation. And I give them a lot of choices. Well, one could be the creation of the Federal Reserve, which is an engine of inflation. Number Mm -hmm. two could be going off the gold standard. Number three, it could be adopting Keynesian economics. Uh, Number four, it could be the Bretton Woods Agreement, 1944, which made the dollar rather than gold uh, the, uh, the world currency. Or it could be all of the above, or it could be never ending wars. Maybe we, we live with never ending wars anymore. So I gave them all these choices. And of course, the, the, the correct answer is all of the above. But yeah. if there's one single factor, it's going off the gold standard, according to these two Harvard economists, because we lost the discipline to control our inflation. So all this argument about inflation coming back and so on, well, it never went away. We've always had inflation and we are, we continue to have inflation because of the legacy of Keynesian economics and going off the gold standard. Yeah. It seems like there's almost this uh, trickery going on with when it comes to inflation, like they plan for a certain amount of inflation. And if they have less than that much inflation, then they act like there's no inflation. Um, 
I've seen that with uh, people have explained Japan's economy to me before. It was a Keynesian economist that was explaining it. I'm like, they have inflation. It's just lower than what they expected. So it's still there. So it, it's just kind of interesting. And the whole the endless wars thing ties in with it because the endless wars are made possible by the Federal Reserve endless printing. Because if you can't print money, you can't fund endless wars. But if you can print money, that makes the endless wars possible. Yeah, war is the health of the state. And there's no question that uh, we've made it easy to finance these wars. We also have a new new technologies that are coming on board all the time in military use. And as a result, uh, we want to test out these uh, new instruments of war. Uh, So we have a war in Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, the Middle East, Russia, Ukraine. We got to try out all our new weapons. Yeah, it's the military-industrial complex that Einst- uh, that Eisenhower warned against. Very, very much alive and well. So you can list that as one of the five reasons for permanent inflation: never-ending wars. Yeah, I think that's a legitimate argument. Since World War II, we've had the Korea War, we had the Vietnam War, we had the, these wars in the Middle East. I mean, it's just never ending. Yeah, I'm 39 and there's never been a year of my life that I remember that we weren't in war. And it's, it's kind of wild. We have a volunteer army so you don't have to go to war. War as hell. Yeah, yeah. My, uh, My grandfather was drafted into World War II. But yeah, in my lifetime, we've never had to go through that, luckily. But yeah. It's still very unpleasant unpleasant to see the reality of it. So um, with Freedom Fest, how did Freedom Fest come about for you? So Freedom Fest, I came up with the idea of Freedom Fest when I was made president of the Foundation for Economic Education. It's the oldest free market think tank. It was based in New York, 35-room mansion, had a long-time tradition since established since 1946. And I was made president of of Fee, but I had seen that Fee had kind of lost its luster. A lot of people didn't know about it anymore, even though it was the original free market think tank. But now today, Cato and Heritage and Reason and all these other organizations are are quite much more dynamic and more famous because the original founder, Leonard Reed, passed away. So I said, what can we do to jumpstart fee and bring it, bring back its glory days? And so I said, well, let's have a national convention. We've never had a national convention bringing together all the freedom organizations and bringing together all the freedom lovers. And let's, let's have it in Las Vegas, the most libertarian city in the world. So in uh, May of uh, 2020, uh, 2002, we had our first fee fest. And it was a big success. We had Ben Stein as our speaker. We had 850 people show up. Very popular. Unfortunately, I was not very good at fundraising. I only lasted a year as president of Fee, but I decided to, con- I took Freedom Fee Fest and changed it to Freedom Fest. And we're now a for profit organization. And we've been doing it ever since. And we have two to 3,000 people who come together. And the whole idea is that once a year, we all live busy lives, but can once a year come together to learn from each other, to network, to socialize and celebrate liberty because we've been losing our, our liberties. The Economic yeah. Freedom Index has been in decline. So what can we do? Well, the enemies of freedom seem to be better organized than we are. So why can't we get all organized and come together once a year. And I think I've been pretty successful in that. Uh, we, we have all almost all the freedom organizations coming together. We have a big exhibit hall. I call it one-stop shopping for liberty. And we've done it. We do it every other year in Las Vegas. And then the other years we, we go to other cities. We've been to uh, Rapid City, uh, S- South Dakota, uh, with uh, Mount Rushmore. We've been to Memphis. Uh, next year, we'll be in Palm Springs. But uh, this year, we're a lot of people like Las Vegas. Others don't. So 
every other year in Las Vegas, they have pretty good hotel, cheap hotel rates. They have air conditioning. So it's in the middle of the summer and everybody's indoors. It, it works out just great. So this year it's July 10th through the 13th uh, at the uh, Caesars Forum Convention Center. It's a brand new convention center uh, across the street from uh, Caesars Palace. And we just, we have over 200 speakers. We have a theme every year. Our theme this year is, uh, are we headed uh, for a brave new world based, based on Otis Huxley's uh, book, Brave New World. And there's a lot of uh, uh, issues that uh, he raised in the 1930s, very prophetic about uh, people, people be conforming and people being on drugs if they're, uh, not behaving properly and stuff. It really is quite interesting. So Freedom Fest is kind of a renaissance gathering. So we have philosophy and history and science and technology and geopolitics and economics. We have a finance, three-day financial conference. We have the Anthem Film Festival, the best libertarian film fest uh, films uh, uh, around the world. Uh, we're going to talk about all the issues of taxation, inequality, climate change, at the Anthem Film Festival, Joanne has, my wife has a movie called uh, Climate the Movie. And afterwards, we're having this big panel discussion. Well, is this really the hottest uh, year uh, in history? Uh, is global warming uh, all caused by human behavior? What can we do about it? Uh, do we have to have uh, EVs? And do we do we no longer have fossil fuels? And so that'll be one of our big debate topics. We have a presidential election debate uh, with third parties, unlike the one with Biden and Trump limited to two. We're unlimited with our third party candidates being involved. And we have a live audience, unlike the CNN event. Uh, so we, we have a lot of great speakers uh, at Freedom Fest. We always attract big name speakers. We've had William Shatner before, uh, Kevin O'Leary of Shark Tank, George Foreman, heavyweight champion in the world, John Cleese, the comedian from Britain. Uh, we had Mike, uh, Mike Rowe of Dirty Jobs last year. Um, we, Steve Forbes and John Mackey of Whole Foods are our co-ambassadors. Kennedy is our MC every year. Hmm. Um, so we, we really have a great conference and we get a lot of political people as well. Donald Trump showed up there one time. And so we have senators and congressmen and uh, lots of activity. There's the conference has over 2000 people. It's it's quite a fun event. Uh, Washington Post calls it the greatest libertarian show on earth. So. Hmm. People go to freedomfest.com, find all about it. We're going to have 2,000 wonderful people there. And if you haven't been to Freedom Fest, you know, know what you're missing. Yeah, I'm, I'll be attending this year, and I'm very excited for it. Yeah, you have the, the debate. So I know you've extended invites to everyone. Uh, are the two, I mean, are Biden and Trump supposed to be there? Yeah, there they have on? not. Uh, you know, they're doing their own thing. Uh they are afraid to debate third party candidates. Yeah. They don't want to give any support to third party candidates. So we have the third party candidates from the Green Party, the Libertarian Party and the Constitution Party. We have extended, uh, we think RFK, he did speak, uh, RFK Jr. Uh, spoke last year in Memphis and he's is a good possibility he will come to our conference as well, but he hasn't been confirmed. Um, so we'll see what happens. I mean, we've, we've, we've sent out invitations to all of them. Trump may be in jail. Who knows? So we'll, yeah, I don't know if he's going to be able to make it and stuff, but uh, we've, we've, we have a, we have a great lineup uh, this year. We have uh, Steven Pinker from Harvard, the Harvard psychologist uh, who's written some best-selling books. We have Lord Matt Ridley, who is from the UK also a, uh, the top public intellectual from the UK. Um, we, we have, uh, I don't know. I was, I was making a, a list of all of our speakers. We, I think Robert Kawasaki of rich dad, poor dad is coming. Mm -hmm. He's always entertaining. One of the things that's really cool this year, we're having an AI debate. 
Hmm. But the AI debate is between two AI computers. Interesting. So they're going to make the case for colonialism, pro-colonialism, and anti-colonialism. We're going to have these two AI uh, debates uh, by by these computer-generated software programs, and we'll see how good they do. I mean, this is a first, and it'll yeah. really be fun. It's like having two AI chess chess tournament, uh, see how, how well they do, and we'll see how good the AI chat GB, GBT type of stuff is. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm really big into AI, and my friend and I are actually designing a, an application where you'll be able to have, we have a moderator and then AI bots, up to four bots that'll be able to communicate with each other. So you can have a debate between AI chatbots without any or without much human intervention at all. Because I've always liked that idea. I always liked the idea of, let's, because right now you can do it, but you can you just copy and paste between the different bots. And I, I talked to my friend Vladimir, I was like, maybe we can uh, build an application where you don't have to do the copy and pasting. You can just say how many uh, back and forths you want to go and just let them rip and have at it. So it yeah. sounds like you're doing that there. So well, you should really come cool. to this AI event, which I think will be on Thursday uh, afternoon, um, and and uh, I think it would really be fun to uh, see how how well that works out. Uh, we're also having a Bitcoin debate on how long the Bitcoin bubble can last, uh, and uh, we have this debate on climate change. Uh, will Malay in Argentina succeed? That uh, we're having a big Latin American panel on that, which I think will be really interesting. Uh, we have a luncheon with uh, Steve Pinker from Harvard and Matt Ridley from the UK uh, with Michael Shermer, the editor of Skeptic Magazine, interviewing those two. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we have the pitch tank, which is entre entrepreneurs, uh, their new ideas that they have, uh, kind of like a Shark Tank version. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, between all of these different uh, events, uh, plus, plus, by the way, we have a couple of uh, actors coming. Ice T, uh, who is the longest running uh, actor on Law and Order, and Rob Schneider, the comedian and director uh, and uh, actor, uh, will be talking about free speech and stuff. Uh, unlike the past, for the very first time, we have Governor Joe Lombardo, the Nevada governor, coming and, and greeting us. Hmm. Uh, Sisolak was the governor last year. Instead of coming and greeting us, he closed us down during 2020. So we were, he's persona non grata at our conference. He was not a very good governor, but we're really delighted to have Joe Lombardo coming because he's vetoed more legislation in the last year or two than any other previous governor of Nevada. So uh, he sounds like a really interesting guy. Looking forward to that. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, my understanding is you're giving some presentations too, right? Yes. I always give a number of talks. I'm going to give a talk on uh, how I win the minimum wage debate every time. Uh, I have a, a formula that I use with students where they don't know initially uh, my views on the middle uh, on uh, on minimum wage. So I give pros and cons and so on. But by the time the uh, session is over, 95 percent of all students reject it. Why? Because I can offer a better alternative. You know, if you can. If you can offer better wages than minimum wage, why would anyone favor the minimum wage? So uh, I, I talk about my strategy for raising the minimum wage without government inter intervention. Mm. I'm also giving a breakfast a Saturday morning on my five uh, best ways to convert students to free market economics, from especially socialists. So I have a I have an art uh, a talk that I give to students called. Uh, What's better than democratic socialism? What could possibly be better than democratic socialism? 
because students are, they find that very appealing, uh, democratic socialism. But I say, actually, there's something out there that's better than that. Come to my lecture and you'll be able to find out. And when I go in the lecture, I show why socialism fails every time, even when it's democratic. And then I say, but you never get rid of a bad idea unless you have a better idea. And what's my better idea? And it's called democratic capitalism. It's called sharing the wealth. And I talk about stock options. I talk about profit sharing. I talk about ESOPs, all these different ways of uh, capitalists and uh, capitalists and uh, labor getting together and working together to be a win-win situation. And by the time that lecture is through, I have all my socialist friends converting to democratic capitalism from democratic socialism. Hmm. So I'm I'm doing some things like that, which I think will be a lot of fun. I also do some things in the exhibit hall that's unusual. I do a white white mates in two chess problem, uh, which students love, and and the first person to solve the chess problem uh, wins a silver dollar, and they come running up to me saying, "I think I've solved it. I think I've solved it." And we go over and check it out. And if they do, then I give them a silver dollar. And uh, people from all over the world are playing, coming and playing chess to see if they can solve the chess problem. They're not, they're not as easy as you think. Some of these, you make two moves to, to checkmate. And it's harder sometimes than you think. I really work at finding some what appears to be really simple, but in fact can be very difficult to figure out. Are there actual chess games between people going on as well? No, uh, this is uh, uh, a chess problem that's set okay. up. And I've had some students bring out the entire chess problem and play chess, but the idea is that every day I change the chess problem. What's cool about chess problems is you can you can work together to solve them. You don't have to have a competition. It can be cooperative. You can work together to try to solve the chess problem. Hmm, so I prefer that. And plus, it's not as long. It doesn't take three hours to play it like you do with a chess yeah, game. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoy chess, but, uh, but yeah. We also have dancing. Our Saturday night banquet is uh, huge. We, it's the only... It's the only conference where people get out and really have a good time and they, and they dance and so on. And then in our exhibit space, in addition to the chess problem, we have uh, Peter Studebaker, our libertarian magician, who's a first rate magician. Um, we have uh, a, a couple of bands uh, with, uh, with uh, Haley and uh, her, her husband, Pablo, who perform. Uh, there's, there's, there's just a lot going on, uh, all the time. So there's something for everybody at, uh, at our Freedom Fest conference, freedomfest.com. That's the place to go. I, this question pertains to me a bit because I'm going for the first time, but what, how do you recommend people that may be going for the first time, get the most out of the, out of the event? So we have posted at freedomfest.com our entire agenda of over 200 speakers and uh, breakout sessions. And so the conference is different for every person. So you need to go to freedomfest.com and under agenda, look under the program under agenda, you look and go down the list and check off what you're interested in attending. So your, your experience will be different than anyone else's because there's 10 breakout sessions at any one time. There's also general sessions for everybody. Uh, that applies to everybody. Like everybody will hear Governor Joe Lombardo, for example, or the presidential debate that we have. We normally have a mock trial, but we postpone the mock trial until next year because of the presidential debate. So we're doing that. Um, but um, uh, you just need to go there and circle what you're interested in attending and uh, and then plan on coming and so on. And, and our our conference uh, is uh, it is one that is relatively inexpensive, I think, considering most conferences cost several thousand dollars, and ours is under five hundred bucks each. Yeah. So uh, plus we have special rates, one hundred ninety seven for students. We have special rates for prof- young professionals, and um, 
we really enjoy having a big crowd there and stuff. So uh, that and the other thing that we do is we encourage everybody to buy a silver dollar. I think I've got one here in my pocket. Uh, so uh, American Eagle silver dollar. These are the coins that are minted every year. And this one's 2024. And so you go to the coin dealers in the area, you buy a silver dollar. And then on Saturday, at our closing panel, you get up with the speakers like Steve Forbes and others, and you get your picture taken holding a silver dollar. So it's hmm. something that's very popular. People love to do. And then they, they, uh, they send it out on social media and stuff like that. So it really is, it really is a lot of fun. That sounds really cool. I'm I'm very excited to go. And I'm excited to meet you there and uh, see the event. It sounds very I like a lot of fun and very entertaining. So, well, Mark, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. I, I really appreciate you taking the time with me. Um, before we wrap up, I first actually I I would love to ask you. I love to ask people about books. So you've mentioned yeah. a few books throughout the interview. Uh, I want to hand it over to you to. Talk about any books that you recommend people read. They could be about libertarian economics, anything you want. Yeah. So I have a, uh, I've written a couple of books. Let me just talk about my own books initially. Uh, yeah. So um, I've written uh, a text, a couple of textbooks, if you will, that are available to laymen. It's they're easy to follow. Uh, one is called "The Making of Modern Economics." And it's in its fourth edition, published by Rutledge. And it tells all the, the great stories of, of the economists from Adam Smith to Karl Marx to John Maynard Keynes to Milton Friedman, all of these people. I tell their story, their personal story, and also their basic economics. I have uh, lots of uh, humor in the book, uh, anecdotes, uh, pictures, and so on. So it's really a fun read. John Mackey of Whole Foods, for example, says he's read the audiobook three times. And uh, so the, uh, these books and others are available at skousenbooks.com, S K O U S E N, skousenbooks.com. And they're at discounts. They're cheaper buying it through my uh, skousenbooks.com than it would be to Amazon or through the, the publisher. Uh, I also have written a, a essay, uh, which was a cover story of, of uh, in Skeptic magazine called Economics of Life Made Simple. It's a 15 page uh, short little essay with six or seven graphs that are very powerful, including that permanent inflation graph that I was talking about. So this this essay has really taken off. It's become uh, pretty uh, popular. Uh, and just to give you an idea, I gave a copy of it to a uh, an accounting professor at Chapman. And a couple of weeks later, he came up to me and he said, you know, Mark, I've always wanted to understand economics. So I read the book Economics for Dummies. And even afterwards, I couldn't understand economics until I read your essay. I think I have a copy of this essay right here, The Economics of Life Made Simple. Hmm. And I I had it printed up because I've had so many requests for this that uh, it's, it's a great introduction. If you want just a simple 15-page introduction with graphs on what economics is all about, um, it's got a little glossary and everything like that. So it's available for $3 each and minimum order three, order, three uh, copies of the essay at skousenbooks.com. Plus, I have some other books there as well that you might find of interest. Uh, but those are some of the books that I really think are really important. As far as uh, other books are concerned, there's a, there's a wonderful book called The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible, which is kind of a play on, on uh, Gulliver's Travels. And it's the story of a uh, of uh, Jonathan Gullible, who was a sa sailor, and he got uh, he was on a ship, and he got thrown overboard, and he lands on the island of Corrupto. It's the name of the island. And the first thing he encounters is a bunch of people hunched over that nobody will stand tall. 
they're all hunched over. And he says, well, why, why are you all hunched over? And he said, well, because of the toll tax. And he says, what's that? And he says, well, we all know that tall people are more successful. So we're taxing success on this island. And so uh, if you're tall, you're going to be taxed. So all the people hunched down to avoid being tall and avoid the tall tax. That's just an example of one of many different things that that the book talks about. It's called The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible by Ken Schooland. And it's been translated into 50 languages. Uh, I don't sell it on my website, but if you go on Amazon, uh, Adventures of Jonathan Gullible, it's a great introduction to uh, sound free market economics. That would be one of my favorite choices. Awesome. Well, Mark, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Before we wrap up, uh, do you want to give the listeners anywhere else that they can reach you on social media or your website, uh, anything more about Freedom Fest you want to offer? And then, yeah, anything else you feel like sharing? Yeah, uh, so uh, the, the website is freedomfest.com uh, for our conference, once a year conference in Las Vegas or other cities. Uh, Skousenbooks.com for my uh my various books. And then my newsletter, if you're interested in investment newsletter, markskousen.com is the site for that, markskousen.com about my investment newsletter. And we offer an introductory offer. My newsletter comes out monthly plus a weekly um, voice uh, hotline. Uh, and that can be bought for under $100 introductory offer at Mark Skousen. Uh, dot com. So check that out as well. So anyway, Artie, it's been a real pleasure and I uh, hope, uh, hope your listeners enjoyed it and I hope to see you all at Freedom Fest. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Okay, take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab, where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media on x at rdtmpodcast and Instagram at thoughtfullymindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time. Stay thoughtfully mindless.